nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Jochen Knopf, whom I know very well. We figured we are working together since 17 years already or so. Um, Professor Knopf and I go back to our time at, uh, in, in Aachen slash Jülich. Jülich is a research center in Germany, and Aachen is a well-known university where uh, Professor Knopf was getting also his uh, physics education. Uh, he moved on then, spent some time at MIT, uh, then joined IBM Zurich. Where How was it Jülich afterwards? Jülich afterwards. <laughs> Sorry, see, I already skipped that. And I'm not even trying to give you the years, just to give you a rough idea. Then MIT, then he went uh, to uh, IBM Zurich. From there, he got a call uh, for professorship in Dortmund. And uh, when did you join Aachen now? 2011. 2011, he joined Aachen, uh, took over this large institute. The setup in, in Germany is that there are different types of professorships, so this is definitely considered a <coughs> big one. And we are very happy and proud to have you here and talk about handling device, which is one of those things that he and I are working on for a long, long time, so I'm very excited to have him here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jörg, for the introduction. It's actually funny that we met 1996 and we have been working together for a longer period than I'm married, you know. I told my wife that and she wasn't too happy. Well, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so uh, um, I will give a talk here about tunnel FETs, device principles and realizations. And before I go into the physics of uh, tunnel FETs, let me briefly tell you what a good MOSFET is supposed to do. I put down two points here that are very important and the first one is obvious it's you want to have an on-state performance that is as good as possible and a uh, appropriate figure of merit would be here the CV over I measure. Now I use here very simple equations uh, almost obsolete textbook equation but to make that point uh, they are actually uh, still valid um, because when you want to improve the on-state performance you can do something about it. You can go to materials that have a higher carrier uh, mobility and of course you can scale down the devices further and that's why you have two knobs to turn in order to increase the performance of these devices. Now when you scale down a transistor you have to be a little bit careful because otherwise you will experience so-called short channel effects and what this means is shown here. You see here the conduction band profile of a conventional type FET and the source channel PN junction have a certain spatial extent. That's what I call lambda here and if I then uh, scale the, the channel length down what I basically get is um, an overlapping PN junction, a reduced barrier, and that's what we call J-induced barrier lowering, and therefore an exponential increase of the current. That's what you see here. And this is of course not good for the second point, because when you take all these devices and you build a circuit, the power consumption of this circuit should be as small as possible. And you see here an expression that shows the um, <laughs> dynamic power consumption, and this is the static one, and if you have a device that shows the strain induced barrier lowering, you will get an exponential increase of the leakage current. That's of course not what you want. So you have to avoid this. And how to do that? Well, you do this um, by making sure that the geometric log set capacitance is roughly 10 times um, smaller than the um, drain capacitance. So if you now take very simple equations here, this is the geometric log set capacitance with uh, this capacitance plate here. Uh, this is the, the drain capacitance and you plug this into this equation. Then you come up with an expression that you should make the channel length roughly three times larger than this spatial extent lambda. And lambda is given by this square root of the uh, ratio of the dielectric constants, uh, the oxide thickness and the channel layer thickness. Now let me give you an uh, everyday example what this really means. So you see here a device um, that has a channel length of 10 nanometer. It's a double gate transistor, you would say, with an oxide thickness of 2.5 centimeters and a channel layer of 5 centimeters. And if you interpret the ratio of the dielectric constant with the compressibility, you would get a lambda of roughly 7.5 nanometers. This means lambda is on the order of the channel length that doesn't work, it's a leaky device, right? You know this when you look at your hands afterwards. Now, what you have to do is, of course, you have to scale down the channel length and, and the oxide thickness. And that's why we are so interested in these novel materials, such as graphene, 
molybdenum sulfide and nanowires with a very thin diameter and also nanotubes because with these materials you have both knobs that you can turn. You get better electronic transport properties and at the same time you have these ultra thin channel layers that allow you a continued scaling. Okay, that's very nice. So that's what I said, you can do something about the on-state performance. But what about the off-state performance? The off-state performance or the power consumption here, that's a little bit more delicate because um, a very good measure to lower the power consumption would be a reduction of the supply voltage. And that's a difficult thing to do. And the reason for this is the specific um, working principle of a MOSFET. Now let's have a look how this works, the switching behavior of a MOSFET. You have here the conduction band profile along the current transport direction. And I have assumed here a bias that is large enough such that all carriers that can contribute to the current come from the source Fermi distribution function. Now the barrier is pretty high and only the carriers in the tail of the source Fermi distribution function can contribute to the current. So you will get a, a certain off-state leakage here. And what you see here is a 90 degree tilted IDVGS curve on a logarithmic scale. If I now apply a gate voltage, you move this barrier basically down and this gives rise to a larger and larger fraction of the exponential tail that can contribute to the current. You get an exponential increase of the current. And this is what you see here. And if you then uh, calculate the appropriate figure of merit, the inverse subthreshold slope, you can just take the derivative of, a, of the logarithm of ID with respect to VGS. And then you can use the chain rule here in order to come up with this expression. It's a little bit mathematical, but in in fact, it's very simple because you get here just uh, ID over KBT and the change of the surface potential, this potential maximum with changing gate voltage is at best one. So a one-to-one -one change is the best you can get in an ideal MOSFET. And then you have here, uh, the um, uh, you basically transfer the gate potential into a gate voltage. This gives you a factor of minus E. And when you plug everything in, you get this famous KBT over E ln 10 relation. That's the inverse subthreshold slope and that is at room temperature 60 millivolts per decade. The interesting thing here is that you cannot do anything. It doesn't depend on material properties and it doesn't depend on the geometry of the device. Any device that relies on a modulation of injection of carriers from a thermally broadened Fermi function will show this limit of 60 millivolts per decade. So that's difficult because when you want to lower the power consumption, you have basically two choices. You can either lower the supply voltage, but then you will lose on-state performance. It's not very nice, that's not what you want. Or you can shift the threshold voltage, then you have the same on-state performance, but then you will get an exponentially increasing off-state leakage. That's not good for the power consumption, that's not what you want. What you really want is a device like this, showing um, a lower off-state performance or a lower off-state leakage current and an inverse subthreshold slope steeper than 60 millivolts per decade. And that's where the tunnel fit come, comes in because tunnel fits potentially allow you to realize a device like this. Now let's have a look how a tunnel fit looks like. A tunnel fit is basically a gated NIP or PIN device as is shown here. And you see here the conduction and valence band profiles along the direction of current transport in the on state of the transistor. In the on state, the valence band in the channel is lifted above the conduction band in source and you have opened a window for band-to-band -band tunneling. And then you get a certain on state performance, as you can see here. If I now apply a gate voltage and move the bands down, this window becomes smaller and this barrier becomes thicker, meaning the current goes down exponentially and that's what you see here. And then at some point there is no overlap here anymore. There is no window for band-to-band -band tunneling and this means you get a certain off-state leakage current here. And to make things very simple, I just say, okay, this is the minimum current this device can actually provide and this is given by the source and drain Fermi distribution function because carriers up here and down here can still contribute to the current. This already tells you that you have to have a sizable band gap in order to get really to very low leakage currents. So basically, if you then um, keep on moving the bands down, the current is approximately constant and then at one uh, point it goes up again and then this device will show an ambipolar behavior because you get band-to-band -band tunneling here. And of course, if you um, um, lower uh, the uh, drain source bias, then uh, the ambipolar behavior will occur at um, a larger gate voltage 
and if you apply a large VDS then you cannot switch the device properly off anymore and you will get this ambipolar behavior with a significant leakage here. So that's basically how the device works and um, in principle because of this, this, this tunneling, band-to-band -band tunneling, uh, you have the potential of getting this device that shows this steeper slope. However, when you look at experimental realizations of a tunnel FET so far, you usually experience this. The tunnel FET shows at best a point slope, smaller than 60 millivolts per decade, so a slope in a very small gate voltage range that is steeper than 60 millivolts per decade. However, on average, if you have some threshold voltage here, usually the average slope is larger than 60 millivolts per decade. You also have an on-state performance due to this, this tunneling process that is inferior to a conventional type FET. And then in the end you might ask well, what is the use uh, of, of this device if it has a uh, offset performance that is worse and the on-state performance as well. On top of this, um, if you look at the ID VDS curves, you very often see this exponential increase of the current here and that's very unfavorable if you think of logic applications if you want to make an inverter this uh, will basically reduce strongly the noise margin of the inverters and that's what we uh, the reason for this is what I call drain induced barrier thinning and I will uh, talk a bit about this at the end of my talk so what can you do in order to make the device work properly now in order to figure that out, let uh, us first of all get a very simple model how the transistor works and get a closed expression for the drain current as a function of geometry and, and the respective voltages because then we can see what we have to do in order to improve the performance. And for simplicity I just consider here a nanowire device with a wrap gate architecture so it's 1D to make everything simple and then I use the Landauer expression for current transport. Where you have inserted here the transmission probability for band-to-band -band tunneling and as you can already see I want to use the WKB approximation in order to get a closed expression. And then you have of course here the, uh, the difference between the source and drain Fermi functions. So basically in order to get a closed expression I can consider this um, source channel PN junction with uh, a simpler potential namely this one here. And this uh, allows me now to get a closed expression because I have now a triangular shaped potential barrier um, and I can get an analytical expression for this WKB approximation. And what you have to do is basically this. This is the textbook expression for the WKB approximation. You basically have to integrate from zero here to the thickness of this, this barrier and then no matter what energy you consider you always have this triangular barrier with a height of the energy gap and then you do the inter integration and the only thing you have to do is you have to replace this um, thickness here of the tunneling barrier with the respective um, band gap and so on and so forth. And you can do this by noting that the ratio between the energy gap and the thickness here equals the um, ratio of energy gap plus this delta phi. This delta phi is basically the energy window where band-to-band -band tunneling can occur and then the spatial extent of the PN junction. And the spatial extent of the PN junction is basically this lambda in the, in the channel that you already saw plus a lambda that comes from the source contact. And both are extremely important and you have to work on both in order to make this device work properly. So when you go through the algebra bar, you basically end up with this expression here and the nice thing is that this expression does not depend on energy. So you basically can go back, put this in here and then do the integration over the energy and get then a closed expression for uh, the drain current. And once you have that you can calculate the inverse threshold slope and see what is needed in order to get a steeper slope than 60 millivolts per decade. So if you calculate according to this formula here, this textbook formula, the inverse subthreshold slope, you basically get this expression here. You have ln 10 over um, E and then you have two expressions, namely the first one here is basically a change of the tunneling probability with changing gate voltage, with changing surface potential. And the second one here, this capital F is basically the uh, integral of the difference of the source and drain Fermi function. So you get a change of this capital F with, uh, with changing surface potential. Now let's see what happens if this first expression here is the dominant one. If this is the dominant one, then oh, there's something more I wanted to say here. I told you that in a conventional type FET, 
Uh, the reason for the 60 millivolts is this, that you have an injection from a thermally broadened Fermi function. So if you want to make a steep slope device, you have to get rid of the Fermi function or the thermal broadening. Okay? And this first expression is like getting rid of the Fermi function. Because you do not inject from this Fermi function anymore, you modulate the current by modulating the tunneling through it. And then you know, of course, that the tunneling exponentially depends on the thickness of the barrier. And that's why you get an exponential increase. And this one here is as we will see, getting rid of the thermal broadening, and this is actually what we want to have in a tunnel FET. Now let's suppose this first expression here would be the dominant one. What you see here is a, a calculation of the drain current. This is the current spectrum, and these are the valence and the conduction band. And if I now switch the device on, and in this case, the first expression here is the dominant one, you see you get band-to-band -band tunneling in this energetic window here, however, uh, tunneling occurs mainly where the barrier is thinnest and then what you get here is uh, an IDVGS curve that shows this point slope that might be steeper than 60 millivolts per decade but you get an S that depends on gate voltage and then in the end you get an average inverse subthreshold slope that is larger than 60 millivolts per decade. So that's, that's not what you want. Let's have a look at the second expression. Come on here. Let's suppose this one here is the dominant one, and this occurs if the tunneling probability is already close to one, then it doesn't change much with changing gate voltage. So you have basically a band profile, as you can see here. And again, if we look at the calculation here, this is the current spectrum, and then you apply a gate voltage, you move the bands up, and then you get this band-to-band -band tunneling in the entire window, this delta phi. And in this case, if you now compare the first and the second case, in this case, you can get an inverse subthreshold slope steeper than 60 millivolts per decade over several orders of magnitude. And the reason is now that you have created a bandpass filter. As you can see here, you have the band gap in source and the band gap in drain. They act as a bandpass filter, cutting off the low and high energy tails of the source Fermi function. That's basically cooling the device. Okay, and that's what gives you uh, a, a device that really shows over several orders of magnitude an average inverse subthreshold slope steeper than 60 millivolts. So that's that's what you want to have. How do you get there? Well, we can go back to the WKB approximation and see what kind of optimizations can we do in order to make this tunneling probability as large as possible. Now, let me go through a number of things here. And the first one would be the band gap. If the band gap becomes smaller, then the tunneling probability goes up. However, you cannot make the band cap too small because that's what I already told you. If the band cap is too small, you will um, get leakage. So this current level will go up. And then you're restricted to extremely small VDS because otherwise you will get this, this ambipolar behavior here, which is not, not suitable for when you make, think of logic devices and so on. So um, in terms of band gap, a heterostructure would be very good where you have a large band gap in source, a large band gap in the entire device and only a small band gap at the tunneling interface here. Okay, um, But I'm not going to talk about heterostructures. This is just the way how to further improve uh, and play with the band gap in order to improve the device. Let's go to the second point. Um, you can also lower the effective mass. So going to a material with a lower effective mass, this of course allows you to improve the tunneling performance. However, the effective mass shouldn't be too small due to the following reason. If you look at a conventional type FET with a small effective mass and you scale the device down, you will get direct source drain tunneling. The same thing will also happen in a tunnel FET, but the things are a little bit more severe here. Because what, it, what you want in principle is you have to make sure just use this expression here for the thermal current, and this is a WKB approximation for a rectangular potential. You get this one, and from this you can extract a minimum channel length that is suitable for a certain effective mass. Now in a tunnel FET, things are a little bit more severe because you wanted to have an off-state performance, a leakage current that is lower than in a conventional type FET, so it's even harder to to, to get this. And on top of this, if you look at the band structure here, in order to really lower VDS, you have to make sure that the valence band is very close to the conduction band here, such that a little voltage is enough to switch the device on. And therefore, the effective barrier here for, for tunneling is much smaller than in a conventional type FET. And therefore, the scalability suffers a lot more in a tunnel FET if compared to a conventional type FET. So if the effective mass becomes too low, well, you have to live with a rather long channel length, or you have to 
get the right trade-off between tunneling and scalability. Nevertheless, uh, effective mass lowering down is, is really a way that you, um, a suitable way in order to improve the performance. Okay, these are just the potential that I wanted to show here. Okay, now let's go to the, to the third knob that you can turn, namely this lambda parameter. And the first one we already know, namely the lambda in the, in the channel. And we have seen that the best way to do this is to go to ultra-thin channel layers um, such as graphene or, or uh, carbon nanotubes. Because in these devices I can um, make this lambda parameter rather small and therefore get a, um, a steeper PN junction that improves the tunneling performance. Now let me show you some examples that this <coughs> really works. And the first one here is a um, a silicon um, nanowire tunnel FET. It's a device that is based on an in situ grown VLS uh, grown nanowire, in situ doped. And uh, this uh, nanowire was then put on an oxidized wafer and then you fabricate some contacts here. And we also fabricated a top gate. So you have a top and a bottom gate and this means you can with one device see what is the impact of um, going to smaller gate oxide thicknesses. And uh, these are the experimental data here. You can see that in this case you get a terrible inverse subthreshold slope, 1,200 millivolts per decade. And here if you improve the oxide thickness you get 800. But the important point here is that with this simple WKB approximation that I've just shown, you can reproduce very nicely the experimental data, at least in the off state. And from going from here to here we just changed the oxide thickness from this 100 nanometer to 20 nanometer and then you can very nicely reproduce the experimental data. So this shows the device cannot work any better because you have a very thick nanowire and you have very thick oxide and so on and so forth. But it also tells you if you scale everything further down, you can also expect a strong improvement. Here's a second example and um, this is what I meant here. We have been working quite uh, a lot together, Jörg and I. This device was actually fabricated by uh, Jörg at, at, at IBM. And you see here, um, this is a dual gate carbon nanotube FET where you have a back gate and then there is um, a, a top gate here. And on top of the top gate, you have the, the, the nanotube that is then contacted. And if you apply a negative back gate voltage, you induce P-type sections here. And then if you apply a negative um, voltage at the actual gate, you get a conventional type FET, as you see in this schematics, with an inverse subthreshold slope of 65 millivolts, almost ideal. However, if you go to large gate voltages here, then you open up, as you can see in this schematics of the conduction and valence band, you open up a channel for band-to-band -band tunneling at both interfaces, source channel and channel drain, and then you get an uh, increase of the current with an S of 40 millivolts per decade. Now there are only very few data points here, but we did a simulation and this uh, straight line here is the respective simulation and you can see how nicely it fits the experimental data and we are very sure that this is really due to band-to-band -band tunneling. And the reason why you get this steep inverse subthreshold slope here is really this ultra-thin channel layer, a nanotube with a diameter of 1.4 nanometer approximately. Okay, here's an, um, uh, the last experimental example that I want to show you. This is work done by Professor Mantel at the Forschungszentrum Jülich. Um, they fabricated the planar SOI tunnel FETs and then they changed to a, a gate all around architecture. And then you can see that if you use this WKB approximation, you expect something like a, a factor of 750 higher on state performance. And that's what you roughly also get here by going from a planar architecture to a nano very thin nanowire with a rep gate architecture. So that's very nice because you can do something in order to improve the performance by scaling everything down and by making this lambda channel small. The problem is this one here, this lambda doping. This is basically the screening length in the contact and that has also, uh, this has also to be also to be made very small because otherwise you cannot expect to get a um, really nice working TFET. The problem here is that if this, this lambda, this is basically, as I said, the depletion length, if this is too large, then you would have a small doping concentration. Then due to the particular way how you operate the device by applying a negative gate voltage and moving the bands up, the depletion length extends into the source contact and therefore you cannot make the band-to-band -band tunnel barrier thin enough. This means this lambda doping has to be very small and this means you need a high doping concentration in the source contact in order to screen the gate impact on the source. And that's a very important point because in these nanostructures, 
such as nanowires and so on and so forth, doping is a very delicate task. And there are a number of reasons for, the, uh, for this. The first reason is shown here. This is work done at IBM Zurich and what we did there is we um, in situ doped silicon nanowires and then made the, the diameter smaller and smaller. And what you then see is that if you measure the resistivity, the resistivity actually goes up. Now, first of all, there are a number of things that could happen. You can have interface states, you can think about a quantization and so on and so forth. But we figured out that the real reason why this resistance goes up here is basically a deactivation of the dopants. So we estimated the interface state density and then sub, uh, subtracted a depletion region as is shown schematically here and then um, rescaled everything uh, as resistivity as a function of the electronic radius, which is basically this orange here, and then you still the, uh, see that the resistivity goes up, and the reason for this is really a deactivation of dopants. And we are not the only ones who have observed this. There's a group in Jülich uh, who showed the same effect in indium nitride. So it's very difficult to, to dope properly these, these very small um, nanostructures. However, you have to dope them here. If this would be a tunnel FET, you have to dope this extension here. And this is one of the reasons why um, it's so, so difficult you know, to, to actually get an appropriate doping concentration. The other reason is that when you consider this 1D for instance, 1D structures could also be 2D, and these structures very often have a low density of states. And if you have a low density of states, then this, the screening will actually not be very large, meaning you will have an impact on the source contact when you apply a gate voltage and move the bands up. Remember what we wanted to have. We wanted to have a bandpass filter behavior. And this bandpass filter behavior can only work if you can very efficiently screen the gate impact on, on, the, on the source contact. Otherwise, you will not have this bandpass filter behavior. You will have a, a smeared out potential profile into the source contact, and this will not allow you to get very uh, high uh, tunneling here. So any material that has a low density of states, um, well, you will have this, this kind of problem here. And as an example, and I might gonna quickly browse through these slides. An example here is um, such a dual gate graphene transistor that was actually built by Chi Hong, who sits in the audience. Um, when we concentrate on the device B, um, and what you then basically do is for zero front gate voltage, so you have a front gate voltage here and a back gate voltage, and for zero front gate voltage you get the normal resistance versus back gate voltage characteristics that you know. However, if you apply a sufficiently high front gate voltage and then go through the back gate voltage, you see that a second peak occurs here. And this second peak, the reason for this is schematically shown here. So this is for zero gate voltage and then what you basically do is you move this cone up and down through the Fermi level and then you get this kind of resistance versus back gate uh, curve. However, if you go to large front gate voltages, then you separate these cones and if you now apply a back gate voltage, then you get one um, um, uh, high peak here due to this cone and you get this shallow peak here due to the cones in the source and drain areas. And this basically means, and we have also done some simulation that, that, that can reproduce qualitatively very nicely the experimental data. This basically means that even if you have a metal in contact with the graphene and you have a 300 nanometer oxide, you're able to move the cones in the graphene up and down because of the low density of states. And when you now think of a tunnel FET and the, the, the actual gate has such a large impact on the source um, on the source contact, you will not be able to make this very uh, thin band-to-band -band tunnel barrier because of this strong impact. So you have to do something about it. Well, in a conventional semiconductor, you would say, well, then I go to higher doping. Higher doping will give me the screening that I need. The problem is, if you go to too high doping, what you then get is this. In this case, you have a 1D, this is again, this, this 1D nanowire, for instance, uh, 1D density of states, and now I need a very high doping level in order to screen the gate impact. But a very high doping level means in 1D you have a very large separation of the Fermi energy from the conduction band. And what then happens is if you switch the device on, then you again inject carriers from the Boltzmann tail of the source Fermi function. 
So at best, you will get again a device that shows 60 millivolts per decade. Okay, and you see here some simulation that show this effect. This is for a carbon nanotube. If you increase the, the source Fermi energy, then gradually you go from a steep slope device to basically then a conventional type FET. Okay, so you cannot afford to have very high doping concentrations in these low density of states materials. But at the same time, you need to screen the gate impact. And that's a difficult task to do. And that's why we are looking into electrostatic doping. So using gates not only in the gate area, but using gates everywhere. Because when you place a gate and you, for instance, consider a wrap gate architecture with high K gate dielectric, we know that we can make this lambda in the channel very small. So why not taking the gate also in the source? Well, it's in the drain also here, but you only need it in the source contact. Why not taking a gate here and then doing the same reasoning, taking a gate, wrap it around, use high K gate dielectrics and so on, and then we can totally avoid any dopants and any dopant-related issues. Okay, and that's why we, in our lab, we fabricate um, so-called buried triple gate structures um, as a template not only to be able to, uh, to investigate tunnel FETs, but also to screen a number of materials for the suitability for tunnel FETs. And what we do is the following. So we start with an SOI wafer and then it's oxidized and we, we use ion implantation and activation to form a highly doped silicon layer. And then we use uh, wet chemical anisotropic etching. And then we have two fabrication lines. The first one here has a rather thick oxide and the oxide is made in order to be able to distinguish mono and bilayer graphene on top of these side gauge structures here. The other one here, we use a modified low cost process um, such that we have not a, the, this thick oxide here on top. Then we deposit aluminum in this case and use CMP to polish everything. And then in the first case, we use a plasma oxidation. In the second, we use ALD oxide in order to fabricate these triple gate structures. And what you now have is you have two uh, silicon gates here and one center aluminum gate. And due to this, this shape, you know, with this 45.7 degrees, um, the gate on the lab is, is, is not so severe as if, um, if you had uh, vertical structures. Okay, so this is what we uh, have done. And you see here an SEM cross section of how this looks like. This is the first fabrication line where you have here the aluminum gate and this is the the rather thick oxide, it's around 100 nanometers, in order to be able to identify a monolayer graphene in an optical microscope. Now you might not see it here, but believe me, there is a monolayer of graphene sitting there. And then you just fabricate contacts here, and these are gold contacts in this particular case. And you can then play around with all three individual gates, create PN junctions, and try to create um, a tunnel FET will not work with the monolayer graphene because of the no, you have not a sizable band gap here. But uh, what we currently do is to work here with bilayer graphene. Now concerning the, uh, this uh, modified low cost process, you see here this is in, in, in bulk silicon and you can see nicely that there is no oxide on top anymore here. And if we put this then on the actual SOI wafers and we polished a little bit too much, such that you have a little gate underlap here, so we have to improve a bit further. But what you can see is that you, if you now uh, deposit an aluminum oxide, you have very thin gate oxide, a high K everywhere in all three gates. And you can simply deposit some nanostructures, graphene or whatever, and then see whether you can get suitable tunnel FET action. Here's an example where you see a 30 nanometer graphene nano ribbon. This, this one here um, lies across all three gates. And if you then, we have done some low temperature, well, not too low, but 25 Kelvin. And if you then measure the IV characteristics, then you basically see that with the gates, you can create a rather N-type or a P-type FET. So this just shows that these, these kind of um, uh, buried trigate structures actually work and that you can get the devices that you want. As I said, they, because even with 30 nanometer, we do not have a sizable band cap enough, so we will not see any tunnel effect action here. Don't be distracted by these colors here. This is just to, uh, to increase the visibility that you have really an N-type and an P-type FET. We also have placed uh, in your marcenite nanowires on top of these buried structures. And this is, can be seen here. The nanowires were grown by IBM Group in Zurich. And in this case, we first of all saw here an, an N-type uh, FET and very similar to this dual gate carbon nanotube FET that I've shown, you see here that this is the conventional type branch and this could be a tunneling branch. Unfortunately, we blew the device and uh, we couldn't go then for a real tunnel FET. This will be 
the next step that we want to do. Okay, so in principle what I wanted to show is that this, this um, electrostatic doping is really a viable approach to, uh, to get to working tunnel FETs. Okay, now let's come to the, to la to the last point. This, this is this exponential increase of the drain current with, with VDS. That's, as I said, very unfavorable because if you think of making an inverter, you will lose your noise margin. So where does it come from and what can you do about it? Well, where it comes from is shown here, because basically, and uh, this is different to a conventional type FET, what happens is that at low bias you inject holes into the, into the channel. So even in the offset of the device you will have a, a significant hole density in the channel, and if I then apply a gate voltage, this large carrier density basically screens the, the gate action. It will fix the bands, very much like a conventional type FET, um, far in the on state. Okay, and if I then apply a larger VDS as is shown schematically here, so you inject the carriers and this is the, the, the gate oxide and basically all the voltage drops across the gate oxide, but if I now apply a VDS, then I basically move away the source of, of, of this whole injection here and this means the carrier density breaks down and the gate can again work on the bands and move the bands up. So that's what you get. The bands move up and you can see here that then the the band-to-band -band tunnel barrier becomes thinner and therefore you get an exponential increase of the current. Okay, and that's what we call drain-induced barrier thinning. And this is here an experimental curve and this is a simulation curve that shows qualitatively the same behavior, namely this exponential increase for low VDS. So what can you do about it? There are two things you can do. Uh, the first thing is you can increase the source doping concentration. Because then for a fixed gate voltage you basically move away the injection, the, the Fermi level in drain as well and therefore the injection of, of holes into the channel becomes less. And this is shown here in a very simple model based also on this WKB approximation. If you go from a low Fermi energy to a larger one you get more linear behavior here in the low bias region. However, keep in mind, if the Fermi energy becomes too large, you will get this, you will end up with a device that shows 60 milliwatts per decade. Then you have a linear output characteristics, a conventional, a, 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 a not very well working conventional type FET, okay? That's not what you want. And therefore, I think a better way would be to avoid this drain induced barrier thinning by working with materials that have a low density of states in the channel. Because then what the, the following happens. If you look at the, at the modification of the surface potential here with gate voltage and of course you have also a modification with drain voltage because you have this injection of carriers, then um, you can uh, see that this, this, this modification here is related to the oxide and the inversion layer capacitance with this relation here. And that tells you in order to get rid of this second term here, you have to make sure that the uh, geometrical oxide capacitance is significantly larger than this inversion layer capacitance. That's also called quantum capacitance or density of states capacitance. Now in a one-dimensional system you see that the, the inversion layer capacitance which is proportional to the density of states drops as the energy increases and if you then use a rep gate architecture meaning you get a very high geometrical oxide capacitance you can um, come to this so-called quantum capacitance limit where the bands are basically fixed by the gate voltage. Okay, and then it doesn't matter anymore what kind of VDS you have applied. As you can see here in this simulation, um, for both VDS you see that the bands hardly move. And in this case, you get again um, this linear output characteristics that you, that you need to have in order to make a good inverter. Now there are two options here how you can get there. The first one would be a very low effective mass and then you can afford to have a larger oxide thickness or you have a, a somewhat uh, um, heavier effective mass and then you need of course a, a smaller gate oxide thickness in order to get there. Now remember that these very small effective masses are not very good for the scalability so this would rather be the option you want to go for. Okay. So that basically shows that you can really avoid this drain induced barrier thinning, get linear output characteristics and we know now what kind of effective mass maybe you want to take and, and that the, the band cap plays an important role and the contacts of course are very important. You need to really work on the source contact, on the doping concentration or if you cannot do this, apply a gate and use electrostatic doping. So that brings me to the conclusion how to make a good tunnel FET. 
I would say take a semiconductor material with a band gap, a sizable band gap, something between 0.6 and 1.3 electron volts. Okay, this really very much depends on what you want to do with the tunnel FET and what kind of currents you want to expect and of course what leakage currents you want to have. Okay, um, the best option would be of course a heterostructure where you have a small band gap only at the tunnel interface and otherwise large band gaps in order to keep the leakage as small as possible. Use an ultra thin channel layer either in this planar double gate structure with molybdenum sulfide with graphene, double layer graphene in order to have the sizable band cap or use a wrap gate architecture in order to get a, a, a very good um, and small lambda and therefore a high tunnel, uh, tunneling probability. Use a material with a low effective mass, um, not too low actually, so something around 1.1, uh, um, sorry, um, is, is really a very good number. All the simulation pointed that then you have uh, a good trade-off between scalability and at the same time uh, sufficiently high band-to-band -band tunneling probability. Uh, you should use this ultra thin gate oxides, getting to really high um, oxide capacitances and the low density of states material in order to avoid this drain induced barrier thinning and use electrostatic doping in the source contact. So use the same reasoning that we used for the channel, also for the source contact and when you do this then you get a, a very good screening of the gate action and can, can really expect to get this band pass filter-like behavior that allows you to make a device that shows over several orders of magnitude a steeper slope than 60 millivolts per decade. Okay, let me at the end acknowledge a number of people. This is first a PhD student of mine and a former colleague at the University of Dortmund and then former colleagues at IBM Zurich, um, former colleagues at the Forschungszentrum Jülich and then Jörg and Chihong of course. Um, and then these are people here now at the Institute in Aachen and this is somebody who helped us very much with the CMP in order to get these buried trigate structures and of course the funding agencies here, the German Science Foundation, uh, European Commission and the German Ministry of Education and Research. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the comprehensive presentation. I think a lot of you guys working on tunneling devices, maybe for the first time, got the look at a couple of different angles that we might not have addressed through our meetings also in the as comprehensive way as Professor Knopf presented them. Um, any questions? Use the opportunity. He knows it all. He right? can tell you everything about what's going on in these tunneling devices. Right. Yeah, very nice talk. Thanks, Thanks for coming and sharing this with us. Yeah, I'm just curious about the on state. Do, do concepts from MOS electrostatic supply, I mean, is there a charge C, BG minus VT that is going at some velocity? Can, do, you, do you think about the on state that way or, or is the electrostatics different? Um, I'm not sure whether I fully understand your question, but the thing is, um, in terms of on state, sometimes people say, what about mobility and all these kinds of things? I mean, well, I don't think, but okay, so what? electrostatics plus transport. And yeah. In a, in a MOSFET, the transport is, you know, involves mobility and things. In this case, the transport would involve tunneling. Right. But can I still think of the electrostatics part the same way I would think about a MOSFET? Very much, yes. Because, I mean, in principle, what you just need to do is you need to apply the appropriate electrostatics in order to create this, this very steep PN junction. In particular, when you think about this electrostatic doping, I mean, that's basically very similar to a, to a MOSFET. And concerning transport, I don't care so much about transport. If I have to care about transport, I would be very lucky because this would imply that I have a very large tunneling probability, right? So tunneling, basically, the tunneling probability uh, determines everything. But you can think of some injection velocity there. In a MOSFET, I might get tens of Right, miles. right. But here, the effective velocity that they're tunneling through that barrier is, as I guess, much lower. That's why the drive current is a problem. Right, this is true. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you, if you want to consider, is in this case, yeah, we would have a, a much less injection velocity. Yeah. This gives rise to a lower current. So in some uh, sense, I would look at it this way, that whatever you had lumped before into mobility, which is nothing else but the transmission probability yeah. through the channel, just gets modulated by another transmission probability that you have to add into the mix, which comes from the tunneling, which just brings your effective velocity or effective mobility down, and that's ultimately the reason for the for the uh, currents going down, while the electrostatics seems to be pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, David Frank from IBM gave a very nice talk at a summer school um, 
uh, last summer, uh, where he basically reduced uh, just the mobility and then used a simple MOSFET e equation for everything and could really des describe very nicely these, these tunnel FETs and then see where would be a good ballpark for yeah, making this device a viable alternative or an add-on to current CMOS. So basically you, you, you can actually do that. You can lump everything into a mobility model which would then be related to this injection velocity. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, and you try to pick a low density space, why don't you work on the space much more? What's in the simulation, what's the Is that already the actual state? Yeah, the, the was already pretty, pretty low. Uh, so there are two different things here. This one has a, a low density of states and then you have more freedom in choosing the oxide capacitance or the oxide thickness. Or if you have a, um, a somewhat higher effective mass, then you have to go to really thin uh, effective oxide thicknesses in order to, to have the right size of the oxide capacitance related to the quantum capacitance. Um, Uh, well, not necessarily, because this is again the the, the trade-off that you have to make here. Um, uh, when you when you really want to um, get uh, to high on-state currents, you need a high tunneling probability, and and this implies that you have to go to lower effective masses. And even if you go to um, well, here you can see, of course, that you you get a punishment. Um, I'm not sure whether the same gate voltage, yeah, well, I have applied the same gate voltages, okay, fine. Yes, um, this basically means you have to find the appropriate trade-off between getting uh, the maximum tunneling probability versus having then a punishment if the, if the uh, um, effective mass becomes too small. Uh, again, you have to consider here, I have uh, chosen 50 nanometers in this case, and I had to do this because otherwise I ended up with a lot of direct source drain leakage. Whereas here I can scale down to 20 nanometers and, and still getting a very uh, low off-state leakage current. So these extremely low effective masses that you have maybe in indium arsenide, I think they are not very favorable. You have to go to somewhat higher effective mass. Not too high because then the tunneling probability suffers again. So 0.1 actually in carbon nanotube is a pretty, pretty good op object for tunnel FETs. Well, uh, we also want to study um, a, a more of a great variety, different materials like double uh, double layer graphene, for instance, and things like that. No, I know, I know, I know. Uh, but we'll see. You know, I mean, this is one D, and maybe in two D things are slightly different. Um, but yeah, you're kind of right. There are not too many materials around that would be really suitable for this. But then again, it depends a little bit on, on what, what you want to have, right? If you can say, for instance, I can live with a longer channel length, then you might want to go for somewhat lower effective mass because you say, I don't want to scale my devices ultimately to very small channel lengths. So it's, it's a trade-off, what, what do you want to have? So there is no real recipe that tells you, take this, 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 and then you're there. It really depends on yeah, a number of things and also what, what you actually want to have and what the scalability would be. Right? I mean, maybe you can actually live with 50 nanometers or even larger if you then can make circuits for your cell phone and the cell phone lasts the battery for a week. Well, then, then you would be happy, right? And you could say, okay, I can, I can afford to have somewhat larger devices. Uh, then I make my, my silicon real estate a little bit larger, right? If you then have a product, something like this, where the battery lasts for a week or even longer, that's fine. But it really depends on the application. And, um, so I, I wouldn't say everything narrows down to only carbon nanotubes. Otherwise, we will not have anything to work anymore. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, potentially you can also consider using heterostructure. Yeah. So if we consider using heterostructure, as you mentioned, the, the, the large band gap and the smaller band gap, does any of the restriction or does, the, does that kind of broaden your choice of material, for example, there's effective mass limitation, is anything from there and then you can choose a little bit yeah. Uh, larger range for the yeah, this is this is what I guess because with the appropriate heterostructure and I'm talking about uh, type two heterostructures, 
Um, a staggered lineup would be perfect. Um, then you can you have a larger v a variety of different materials because you can make up with the appropriate heterostructure with something that you might lose um, with this particular material in comparison maybe to carbon nanotubes. Um, absolutely. I think a heterostructure is really something that you that you should go for. So um, I, I, the way I um, I want to chime in, the way I would look at it, some 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 things are lumped together here in the effective mass that come from the source region, that come from the channel region. Sometimes it's a tunneling that we worry about, sometimes it's a density of states we worry about, but we might worry about the density of states in the channel region more for the drive current if we have the doping right. If you would split this mass in two masses, right, you suddenly have much more flexibility. That's yeah. how I would look at the heterostructure. You suddenly have an additional parameter. You can tune one without touching the other, which is often desirable. To do. Absolutely. I mean, if you have a heterostructure where the source contact is made in a way that you have, for instance, a large degeneracy, and still having a, a low effective mass, then you can have a large tunneling. And, and at the same time, if you can dope this, doping is easier than making the electrostatic doping, right? With all these gates, self-aligned processes. And I mean, I have a PhD student working on this. It's a pain in, in the neck, actually, to do it. Um, uh, so if you can dope it, this would be easier. But then you would need a material with a, with a low effective mass. But then again, getting a high uh, carry density means that you have to have a high degeneracy. So if you can make a material that all uh, combines all these properties, congratulations, then you would be there. Uh, I'm not aware of any of those, so you always have to have some trade-offs, right? But um, already kind of splitting what happens in the source from uh, the material properties in the channel from the material properties in the, in the drain is already moving in the right direction. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, drain is not so important, right? The only thing you have to make sure in drain is that there is a band gap that you do not get any, any leakage current. That's all you need. I mean, in principle, you can even leave with a, with a short key contact when you're able to align the Fermi level close enough to the valence band. And if the band gap in the channel is large enough, then, then you're fine. Um, but the, the, the source, the injecting contact, that's the most important here. Because you have this peculiar situation that you move the bands up and then you get this strong impact um, from the gate on the, on the channel. Uh, from the channel on the source contact. You mentioned this dopant deactivation in the small nanotube. Yeah. I'm trying to understand that. Is that depletion from the surface charge? No, no, it's not. The energy is changing. Yeah, the, the activation energy changes. So what this principle in principle means is, um, going back here, so what we did is we, here, we actually, um, we sub uh, subtracted this, this depletion region here from, from our physical diameter and then said, okay, current uh, transport can only occur in this electronic region. And when you then look at the resistance versus uh, radius, you see still an, an upturn of the resistivity. And the idea is here that if you have dopant atoms here, and there's also a theoretical work by a French group, if you have dopant atoms here and, they, and you, you, you make your nanostructure smaller and smaller, then the dielectric environment looks more like air than silicon and therefore the ionization energy increases. You can ma actually make up for this by depositing here a dielectric with the same dielectric constant. We have, we have done this, we deposited aluminum oxide with a K of 8, I think, so it didn't perfectly match, but then you could already see that the resistivity goes down. So in principle, and that's what I said, if you're able to dope the nanostructures, you can avoid this by placing the appropriate um, dielectric here. Of course, this will give an overlap capacitance, but I think for these devices, the parasitic capacitance are not that important. It's first of all important to get the on current as high as possible and a steep slope. But again, as I said, you know, doping is only good if you can make it in a, a proper way. And, and that's actually very difficult. You have to, to, you know, really combine these materials in order to, to get the best out of it. True. When you're designing your devices, what do you take into consideration during the tunnel and you might have a change in the effective mass for a longer channel device, that effective mass might be so much lower that would affect the uh, performance of the device. Could you, could you rephrase your question? I'm not sure whether I fully got you. In the, in the tunneling, like in your PIN structure, when you're tunneling from um, the source into the channel, you might get a change in the effective mass of the carrier. Yeah, right. How would that change the uh, device 
performance? Um, it's not satisfactory. Well, that, that's that's a good question, and I cannot fully un, uh, fully answer this because I haven't done a, a, a real study in changing the effect of masses in the valence and in the conduction, and then see how the effect if is. Um, but of course, it, it will have an effect because if you have a, a higher effective mass in the channel and a low in the source, for instance, then you have a different uh, situation also in terms of the electrostatics, you know, when you want to go to this quantum capacitance limit. Um, so the, the, the best thing really is to have a symmetric band structure, and there we are again at the nanotubes, with uh, one effective mass in the conduction and valence band. That's, that's the best thing you can actually do. Because then it's also easier, you know, to, to work things um, properly to make the appropriate gate in the channel and in the, in the drain contact. Whereas in the other way around, it's, it's a little bit more, more difficult. Um, and then again, as I said, you have to be careful with the effect of masses. I did some simulation on a heterostructure tunnel FET with indium arsenide source and aluminum indium, no, aluminum gallium antimonide channel. And then I thought it would be better the other way around. But then I figured out, you know, that I have to have very long channels because of the very low effect of mass giving rise to direct source and drain tunneling. So I think a symmetric band structure is the best you can, you can go for. Do you want to comment about, because this mismatch of momenta, right, between the source and the channel going from the conduction to the valence band, particularly for these heterostructures, uh, obviously can result in that, in order to get energy and momentum conservation under control, phonons and so on have to be involved. Do you want to comment? At least, I mean, if you consider an indirect uh, band gap material, yes. I mean, the best thing you can do is, of course, take a direct band gap material. Um, Silicon is not, not ideal in this, this uh, case, that, that's for sure. Um, however, I think even with silicon, I mean, if you strain it enough, you might be able to make a direct band cap. At least in silicon germanium or strain germanium, this is possible. Um, so I, I wouldn't rule out silicon completely. Um, I mean, we have seen in the last 30 years that silicon always pops up, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but of course, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, the, the, it, it would be best to have a direct band gap, and then we're, again, with carbon nanotubes, <laughs> a symmetric band structure, direct band gap. Um, that's, that's the best you can do. Does this answer your question? Or? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I think we have perfectly timed what we want to do. Let's thank the speaker again.